again, a special welcome to those who are tuning in online. Thank you for being here with us this morning in person, for those who have made it in person. Uh, what a new year, seven days in. Uh, you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down so far? <laughs> okay, thumbs up, a lot of thumbs up, okay. Nobody wants to be the cranky one who puts a thumbs down. <laughs> So question to, uh, to get the ball rolling this morning. How many of you are people who take down the tree right away after Christmas? No hands. Oh, there's, there's a few. Okay. Uh, how many of you leave them up as long as absolutely possible? Hallelujah, I see those hands too. Okay, so our, our record, uh, you have to understand the context, our record for leaving a Christmas tree up is June Middle of June? No, 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 no. Context means something. Context matters. Okay, so here's, here's, here's how it went down. So, so we had uh, the, 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 the first tree that Denis and I bought together as a couple is, what is it, a six-foot tree maybe? And, and, and we, we still have it. So that kind of became, we don't have that one? It's a different one. I'm a man. Apparently, I'm lost on some of the details. Well, we have this tree. It's the oldest one that we own currently. Let, let, let me say it that way. And so that one is in the basement. And so in the basement is where we put all of our boys, um, uh, their decorations. It's kind of like the, the family tree. And then upstairs we have, you know, a nicer one with lights and silver balls and blue balls. And, you know, the whole, the whole thing that you do at Christmas time, whatever colors you want. So this tree in the basement, eventually we lost the bag for it and it got ripped or whatever. So we had really nowhere to put it. So we, we took everything off and just left the tree up in the corner, right next to the laundry room. And then finally, like, we didn't go downstairs a whole lot at the time. So we go downstairs like, yeah, so apparently we still have a tree up in June. So do we leave it? Do we find a place for it? Well, we found a place for it. So our, our record is June. So beat that. That's the, that's the challenge this year. See if you can make it past June before you take down your, your tree. All year? Man. I like, is it like in the living room area? Nice. Well, I suppose a tree is a nice decoration, right? Oh, man. I love it. So we're starting into a new, uh, a new part of our Jesus series. So I, what I really wanted to do in, in putting together uh, sort of the, the messages in fall and heading into spring was really to reorient ourselves around Jesus, the central figure of history, the central person in the scriptures, the central theme of the scriptures, uh, the central activity in mankind is centered around Jesus, and it's a great thing to always come back to, is that Jesus is the King. He's the King of heaven. He's the King of earth. He's the Lord of our lives. He's our Savior. So we want to come back to, once again, discovering and exploring how amazing Jesus is. So I've kind of picked these, these several sections or themes, and we're moving on now in this new year to the kingdom of Jesus. We've covered the ways of Jesus. Now we're going to talk about the kingdom of Jesus for a while. So this was one of those weeks where, you know, there's, there's method in my madness or madness in my method. I'm not, I'm not sure how you, would, how you would accurately say it, but there are some weeks where, where things come together easily for Sunday morning and other weeks where it, it's, it's more like, uh, it's more like four by fouring in the winter off-road, right? You're just not quite sure where this is going to go or how it's going to end. So, so kind of late in the week, uh, I kind of realized where, where things were really meant to go this morning. And uh, more specifically, last night, me and, uh, me and Christopher and, and Dania, we, we sat down and we watched uh, that Mr. Rogers movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Has anybody seen that? Okay, so like men, specifically talking to you, if you need a good cry... Watch, watch the Mr. Rogers movie. Absolutely fantastic. Absolutely a, a phenomenal, phenomenal movie. Um, so there's a, the, the basic outline of the movie is it's, it's not actually a movie about Mr. Rogers. It's a movie about a reporter uh, for Esquire magazine who does a piece on Fred Rogers. So it's a story of how he went to interview him over several different occasions, and, and his life was kind of in shambles. He had a bad relationship with his father, got into a fight with his father at a wedding in the middle of trying to do these interviews, and, and he's kind of like the guy that does these exposés, right? Kind of turning over the, the dark underside of, of culture and people. So he's kind of known as a bit of a jerk in the industry. 
And so Fred Rogers agrees to do an interview with him, and, uh, and over the course of these several interviews, this guy's trying to figure out what Mr. Rogers' angle is. Now, if you know Mr. Rogers, you're kind of like, how could you be looking for an angle with Mr. Rogers? How could you be looking for the dark side of a, of, of a guy who has a TV show that teaches kids all about life and, and how to deal with difficult circumstances? How could you possibly try and discover that side of Mr. Rogers? So he tries and tries only to find out that he's the real deal. And, and over and over in his encounters with Mr. Rogers, he sees a man who has compassion. He sees a man who can look at, at, at his life that is in the shambles and broken and still reach out as a friend to help him process the frustration and the anger he felt towards his father for some things that happened in the past. And, uh, and at one point, this reporter standing next to Mr. Rogers' wife as he's doing kind of like a meet and greet out on the street after a, after a public appearance. And this reporter looks to Mr. Rogers' wife and says, how does it feel to be married to a saint? Right, because by then he realizes that Mr. Rogers is the real thing. And she looks at him and says, I'm not really comfortable with that term because he's... He's a normal man, just like anybody else, and we have a normal marriage, just like anybody else that has its ups and downs, and he's got a bit of a temper, and the reporter kind of looked really surprised. Really? Like this, this man who is so kind and so, so compassionate has a temper? She says, yes, but, but he has some disciplines and rhythms in his life to deal with it. He reads scripture, he has a, a long prayer list of everybody he meets, and he prays through his prayer list, he practices thankfulness. And it's like, are you serious? Like this reporter couldn't actually believe that somebody could have a, a problem with anger but actually have it be so under control. And some of you are like, is that possible? <laughs> can, can I actually do that? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And, and, and it's, it's, just, it's just a wonderful movie. And, and, and through... Through this, the, the, the way that this reporter's life is transformed by encountering Mr. Rogers, I'm like, that, guy, that dude's a pastor in disguise. He's like ninja warrior love assassin. That's like what he is. Like no matter, no matter what's going on, he can wiggle into your life and love you and show compassion and just have so much patience and, and, and be able to take difficult moments and sort of turn them around into something that's positive, something that's life-giving. And I thought, that's a man who has the scent of heaven. A normal guy, just a normal dude who carries the very scent of heaven. And it's like, that is, that is transformative. It's transformative that people who are just so ordinary can be so captured and captivated by a mission to just simply love people and help them through whatever difficulties they may be experiencing. It's just a great great picture of the kingdom. The man on the camera was the same as the man you would meet on the streets in Mr. Rogers. And I thought that was just cool. So cool. It's like an overlay of the principles and the reality of the kingdom being literally dropped into and overlaid in the realities of earth. And you think, can that be possible? Is that actually something that we can experience? Or is this something only for a special few who, who somehow get it? Now, I think if we're honest, we, we've all kind of asked that question. This, this Christian life that we're, ta that, that we're taught about, you know, a life of joy, a life of faith, a life of breakthrough, a life of purpose, a life where, where God seems real all the time, is that, is that just for super Christians? Is that just for smart Christians? Is that just for hardworking Christians? Or is that actually meant to be collectively our experience of who Jesus is? And a story like this gives me hope that it's actually possible and real and relevant for every believer, regardless of you know, what our last week has looked like, what our last month has looked like, what an entire lifetime has looked like. It doesn't matter if we have particular struggles or temptations, the reality of the kingdom is meant to be a reality that overlays and is incorporated into and transforms our life. So I'm going to read 
uh, from Matthew 13. Uh, Matthew 13, uh, verse 24 to 30. It, it won't be on the screen, but you can either listen uh, or you can follow along if you've got quick fingers or quick thumbs. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the, wheat, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and then put them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. I'm sure that the parable is not lost in, in a church like ours with a lot of agriculturally oriented activities. Nobody sows seed hoping for weeds. But we all know <laughs> that there's going to be weeds. You know, praise God that we have ways to deal with that. We're thankful for that. Better yields because there's more nutrients going to our, our crops. However, the principle that Jesus is getting to is that in this life, we're going to experience two distinct realities. Reality one is the reality of our everyday life. Right? The, the culture around us, uh, you know, global forces of economics and war and trade and, and countries and how they relate, uh, our family dynamics, our work dynamics, what it means to earn a paycheck and, and pay the bills. This is sort of the, the daily reality that we live in. Good, bad, and ugly. And the second reality is this reality of the kingdom that is meant to overlay our daily reality. See, the coming of Jesus was also the coming of God's kingdom. And so that kingdom, rather than to be experienced and thought of as something that is far away, that is only for those who have arms long enough to reach it, or a ladder high enough to climb up to it, it's a false way of understanding. It's meant to be a reality that's part of our everyday experience. The wheat and the weeds... The good seed of God's kingdom. And in the middle of his activity, there's, there's weeds that grow. I don't know anybody's garden that don't have any weeds. And that's not a physical reality. That's a spiritual reality. None of us is perfect. And that's okay. We've all got weeds. Turn to the person next to you and say, you've got weeds. <laughs> now turn to that same person and say, but you've got wheat too. <laughs> what a cool reality. Can, can, can we just sort of drop the pretending for a moment that we don't have to pretend to be anything more than what we are? We're a field of God's cultivation, but a field that is also prone to weeds. And not everything's going to be solved this side of heaven. Right? The parable, they said, do you want us to rip up the weeds? No, no, I don't want any of the good seed that I've sown to be damaged. I want every seed that I've sown to just fill out nice and perfectly. So let's wait till the end and we'll separate it all at the end. A mentor of mine once said, it takes a lifetime plus one day to become perfect. Isn't that true? A lifetime plus one day to be perfect. Until then, we're a field with wheat and some weeds. And that's okay. The reality of Christ's kingdom overlapped and overlaying into our lives means we can deal with weeds and God can deal with the weeds in our lives. But it takes a lifetime plus a day for all of the issues to be fully settled. So let's do a little bit of a, maybe a historical 
track through, through the scriptures on what this looks like. So in the beginning, picture the Garden of Eden. Adam was created, Eve was created, but even before that, God spoke everything into existence. The power of his word brought forth the universe, the stars, the lights, the planets, the galaxies, all of that amazing stuff, just spoken into existence. Super powerful and incredible. Even as we sung the, the, the indescribable song, right? You know, the stars in place and, and, and fields and storehouses of snow and, and oceans, and just so cool. It seems like a very natural world, right? Stars, planets, sky, dirt, trees, animals, insects. I guess they're important too at some level. Except mosquitoes. I don't know what God was thinking. I don't pretend to know his mind about mosquitoes, but I guess they, they feed something. Maybe that's good. But it seems like, like such a natural thing, right, that everything he made is so, is so tactile, so physical, so visible. And yet, in the same account of creation, we have a supernatural reality that's also displayed. Before anything was created, what does it say about the Spirit of God? Anybody remember? Hovered over the waters of the deep. Before earth was even fashioned to be something amazing. So we have the Father present, right, speaking everything into existence. The Spirit hovering over the waters of the deep. And Colossians chapter 1 says that Christ was also there. And it was through Christ that everything was made. The agent of creation. So God spoke, the power of Christ was released, and the Spirit was over the waters of the deep. So what we have in this image is a natural world and a supernatural world. Coexisting together. Now think about Adam and Eve in the garden. Perfect fellowship with God. It says God walked with them in the cool of the day. Can you imagine? Like I, I, I I can't actually, I don't possess the proper mental capacity to imagine what it would be like to walk with God in the garden. What kind of conversations would Adam and Eve have had with God in the garden? I don't know, but I'd love to be a fly on the wall for those conversations. It'd be so cool. What did they talk about? What did God share with them? What did he teach them in the perfection of this relationship? The natural and the supernatural were together. The presence of God was an immediate, physical, spiritual reality for Adam and Eve in the garden. Can I just tell you, just, just to demystify this for a second? That's the design. Perfect fellowship with our Father and Creator. Perfect relationship with the one who made us and loves us. But we all know what happens next. Right? Adam and Eve done messed it up. They took what was good, and and, and, and in a moment of independent decision making, they decided to walk away from the design. And in that moment, the reality of the supernatural, the kingdom of God, and our daily lives now suddenly experience a separation. The sin of Adam and Eve created this separation. So this supernatural reality now was something that was out of reach. The entire Old Testament, as it leads up to the coming of Jesus, is just a repeat cycle of we cannot do this on our own. The cycle of the the, the rise and the fall of Israel as as a nation in, in their faith, but also in their position in the world, is a lesson to us that we cannot attain the mixing or the overlay of the kingdom of God in our lives without his intervention, without his doing so. We cannot climb there. We cannot earn our way there. We cannot beg for it. We cannot steal it. We cannot... Uh, We cannot sneak in through the back door in order to have that be a reality. That can only be a reality through Jesus Christ. So as believers, that supernatural kingdom now becomes a part of our lives again, but instead of being something on the outside where God intervenes around us, by His Spirit, He now dwells within us. 
Luke chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus tells his disciples and the religious leaders, because they were asking him, what should be the signs that your kingdom is coming, or that God's kingdom is coming? And Jesus said, you misunderstand. The kingdom of God is in you. So through Christ, this reality of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, those are all interchangeable terms in Scripture. Instead of being that reality that's far away, is a reality that dwells within us. I love that. Jesus made the kingdom accessible. Not just accessible, but ever-present. When you wake up in the morning, it's there. When you put your head on the pillow at night, it's there. When you go through a struggle, it's there. When you fail, it's there. When you succeed, it's there. When you talk, it's there. When you're quiet, it's there. There's nothing that we can do to exit that reality. So my question is, what would prevent us from fully entering that reality? If you're like me, there are times when it, maybe it's still, it feels like something far away. When you think about the reality of your life, right? If things aren't going particularly well or if there's a, a difficult season or, 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 a, or a relationship that's, that's under stress or strain, it's easy for that reality to feel like it's something far away. But the call to our lives is to come back and then remember that it's not out there. I mean, it is out there because God is everywhere. But to remember that it's actually in us. It's in us. He is in us. To help, guide, bless, teach, to convince, to stir. When was the last time your heart was stirred? When was the last time you experienced a moment so tangible with his presence that it made you weep or laugh? That's not a... <laughs> I don't have a wagging finger to wave. But that's part of the design. That's a reality that we're meant to experience on an ongoing basis. So the question is, what prevents us from entering deeper into that reality? We'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get to that at the end, what we can do. But this, this reality of the kingdom and the reality of our lives, through Christ, they're meant to be combined once again. But still in this life, there's troubles. Theologians would call this the almost but not yet reality. The reality that the kingdom is here, and the kingdom is within us, but we still ourselves are fallen. We are redeemed, but we still have this sinful nature. Paul talks a lot about that in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Right? We struggle. We struggle with sin. We struggle with the world around us. Scripture says we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So there is a reality around us, a supernatural reality that is not from God. It's from the enemy that also plays into what's happening. This is the parable where somebody comes and, and, and sows weed among the wheat. So this life that we live is meant to be a beginning and growing reflection of the perfect design. It'll never be perfect until the next life. But we can experience it more and more and more on a daily basis. And again, we'll talk about how to, how to get there or how, how to have a pathway to get there uh, when we close. So from the very beginning, the natural and the supernatural have been intertwined. The kingdom of heaven was fully experienced by Adam and Eve. Then there was a separation, and the rest of the Old Testament is like a pointing towards Jesus. Jesus finally comes through his death and resurrection, now ushers in the kingdom of God, the coming of the Holy Spirit now becomes the seal in our hearts that the kingdom is here with us and in us, but also a promise that one day we will be perfected. One day this life will pass away and we will be in perfection. We will experience the fullness of that perfect design. Today we see a shadow. Paul says like, like a dim mirror. We see a reflection of that design, but it's still not quite totally clear. Because we have, the, we have the broken parts of our world and the broken parts of us that still war and, 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 and limit in some ways our experience of this kingdom. But it's a reality in our lives that can continue to grow. 
So this, the hints of the kingdom in the Old Testament. You know that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit never indwelt anybody? Over and over in the Old Testament, you'll hear the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, came upon Samson, came upon the judges, came upon David, came upon so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. The reality of the kingdom in the Old Testament was the Spirit of God would come upon somebody in power for a special purpose. For Moses, it was leading the people of Israel. Uh, for the judges, it was to obtain military victory and freedom uh, and, and to call the Jewish people back to faith in God. And in the prophets, the Spirit of God would come upon the prophets to speak God's word, to call them back in repentance to faithfulness to their relationship with their Heavenly Father. But it only came upon people. But with Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit would dwell within God's people. It's a totally revolutionary way of doing things. So instead of God saying this, not that he would actually say this, this is just my own human words. But it's almost like God would say, let me do it for you. I'll let my Spirit come upon you, you can accomplish this purpose, and, and my will is done on earth. Through, through this person and this person and this person. But now, with the Spirit dwelling within us, the reality of the kingdom is something that's meant to be far more impacting. As every believer is now a kingdom ambassador. I love that. Some of you don't look convinced that that's a cool thing. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking about the status of your own life, going, how could I, how could I represent Jesus? How could I be an ambassador for the kingdom when I've got this in my life or when I struggle with this or when, or when I'm, you know, I've got lots of work to do and I don't have a lot of time to volunteer and whatever? Just, can we forget all that? Can we just remember that the kingdom is in you? All you have to do is keep your heart open to Jesus and do what he asks you to do and to be who he calls you to be. And the kingdom influence just flows out of who you are. Not because we're something special, but because we're the field and God sows good seed. Let me say it another way. How many of us would actually have the courage to look God right in the face and say, choose someone else? I don't know that I want to be that bold. I mean, we're called to be bold in prayer, but I, 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 don't know, I don't know that I would want to look God in the face and say, pick someone else. I don't have what it takes. Because you know what the answer would be? Of course you don't. But my presence is in you, and that's enough. My son's blood was spilled for you. That should tell you your value that should tell you the influence that you're designed to have. It's, let me say it like this. This is one of my favorite phrases. It's simple, but not easy. Because <laughs> we have to continually call ourselves back to that reality, that he's in me, that he can do anything he wants in me and through me. All I have to do is be a willing vessel. I've said it before. We just have to be a valve that's open. He gets to decide what goes in and through. We just have to be the open, the open vessel to love, to pray, to bless. Can I, can I get silly with it? You are the Mr. Rogers for somebody. Who are those somebodies in your life that you're a Mr. Rogers to? You don't have to look like him. You don't have to wear a cardigan, button up. You don't have to have you know, the, the pointy tip shoes. You don't have to speak softly and in such a quiet voice. You don't have to do any of those things. But you are the Mr. Rogers to some people in your lives. What a, what a wonderful position of influence. And it just comes by being who you were meant to be, who you were designed to be. So the coming of Jesus closed this gap, began the restoration of creation, bringing the kingdom. I have two, uh, how would I say this? I have two, two ideas that often war against each other in, in my mind because in, in some ways, 
and, and we'll talk more about some of these things in the coming weeks. In some ways, the reality of the kingdom in our lives as it's overlaid and, and, and present within us, the, the, there's some ways where that reality is meant to bring things that are miraculous and transformative. So scripture testifies to the power of God being released when the gospel is preached and embraced by people. Miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, miracles of prophetic words being, being spoken. These are miraculous things that accompany the kingdom of God. They're not the only thing that accompany the kingdom of God. But I think they're fantastic, just for the record. But on the other side, this, this, this other side is the kingdom of God is also something that is just so, so tiny and subversive. So, so small, but yet so powerful when, when it begins to have influence in our lives. Remember that parable that Jesus told the kingdom of heaven is like a, like a mustard seed? That faith is like a mustard seed? If you have faith, and you're like, well, the mustard seed is the tiniest, I don't know if it's the, the tiniest of all seeds, but it's a super tiny seed. And out of that seed comes a great big mustard tree. The point is that a little kingdom goes a long, long way. So, so I, I, I kind of war in, in my mind with these two realities that there's, there's, there's power and there's presence and there's life change and, and there's moments where, where faith becomes more real as God does miraculous things in our lives, but even sometimes through our lives as we pray, as we live, as we uh, lean into his presence in us and our spiritual gifts, but there's also this, this side where it's just, it's just so quiet and, and compassionate and, and loving and, and prayerful and intentional that, that, that it just brings transformation without smoke and lights, without a lot of the fanfare. I, I think both are true, but, but I'm, I'm just, I, I'm human, and I'm not sure that I can hold both of those realities together at the same time super well just yet. But I'm getting there as the wheat grows a little bit more, I'm hoping I'll be able to hold those two in perfect balance. I hope you can too. Because God has both the miraculous in store for his people, but also this, this wonderful, steadying, uh, internal influence through his spirit that changes us day by day and moment by moment. I think both are just super powerful and awesome. So the, the, the linear progression is a perfection, a fall, uh, the separation of these two, these two realities. Jesus comes, restores it through his cross and resurrection. This restoration work begins. It won't be perfected until the next life, but until then, we have his transforming presence in us. And through us, he can change and transform the world. I just believe that with all my heart. I just believe that. As I already mentioned, the kingdom of God is clearly the mark of God's presence. God in the garden, in the tabernacle, in the temple, the Holy Spirit coming uh, upon people at, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, the coming of Jesus in Pentecost. These are all moments where the kingdom of God breaks into the world. And now we live in this age where it's permanently within us as believers. So how do we live as citizens of a supernatural kingdom? How do we step into this reality even more from wherever we are today? Maybe this feels far off to you. Maybe this feels like the answer to a question that's been burning in the back of your mind. Could it actually be real? Is there actually more to this Christian life than what I currently experience? The answer is yes, there is more. So rather than having our, our normal prayer time of just listening to Jesus and asking questions, I thought I'd be a little bit more directive this morning. Here's two relatively simple ways that the reality of the kingdom can become something that you experience more in your life. And the first is simply to connect with the king. The original design, remember Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. A relationship unmarred by sin a relationship untainted by confusion or pain or brokenness. This is the design. And even though this is an imperfect world, we can still experience, at least in part, the power 
and the beauty of that design. Just simply by connecting with the king. Through worship, through prayer, through reading scripture. These are, it's the holy trinity of connecting with God. Maybe one of these is easier for you than the other two. That's fine. You don't have to take your schedule and carve out equal time for each of these three activities. God is not legislating how much time you spend in each of these activities. But just know that these are beautiful pathways to connect with God, to connect with our great Father and King. Second, and this is, this is the Mr. Rogers part, develop rhythms and activities that reflect kingdom principles and design. So when you get angry, you could pray. Give yourself a holy time out. <laughs> Take yourself out of a situation if you need to. Or if you're confused, just stop. Just, just pause. Find a quiet place and put on a worship song. And just reorient yourself. We don't have to solve all the problems. We don't have to always know where this thing is coming from or why we're experiencing something. It's not always important for us to know in the moment why these things happen. But it is important for us to know that God invites us to be with him whenever those things come. So some rhythms could be a long walk in nature. Maybe not when it's minus 40. You know, unless you got the gear for it, that's cool. Maybe, uh, maybe it's just sitting on your living room couch, putting on some soft jazz music. I'm not huge on jazz, but you might be. I like live jazz, though. If you ever have a chance to take in live jazz, that is, the, that is the thing. It's really cool. All sorts of rhythms that you could incorporate just to breathe in the reality of this kingdom. It's so cool. And finally, just one last encouragement for you. You're probably far more concerned about it than God is. How do I do this well? How, how, how can I do this so that it works? How can I do this so that my faith grows? Or how can I do this so that there's you know, tangible results that I can write in my prayer journal? Just, just, just calm down and breathe. Just be with him. Here's, here's one, one scriptural example just, just to show you what I mean. Peter and John, you guys might remember the story. Peter and John, they were going to the temple. This is after, after Pentecost. They're going into the temple to pray, and they meet this, this lame guy. Remember the song? You know, they met a lame man on the way. He held his palm, and he asked for some alms, and this is what Peter did say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Boy, that's weird English, but it works. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Because of this miracle, they were hauled in front of the religious leaders. They were told not to preach in Jesus' name. They were beaten for preaching Jesus and for healing this lame guy. They're hauled in front of this huge tribunal, and they said, we can't help it. We need to obey God rather than man. It says they, they kind of kicked them out for a little while, and they had their own little conversation as religious leaders. And uh, it's Acts 4.19. It says, they had taken note that these were ordinary men who had been with Jesus. And it's not complicated. It's actually simple. Simple doesn't mean easy, but it is simple. Just be with Jesus. Kids, you can be with Jesus anytime you want. In fact, he's actually closer to you than you would ever realize. He has a heart for kids that they grow up knowing him, knowing his truth. And you can connect with him anytime you want. Adults, you too. Anytime you want. Anytime you want, because the kingdom is within you. He's built a way within us to connect with him. And the more we connect with him, the more the kingdom is a reality we experience, and the more the world around us is transformed through it. It really is just that simple. We just have to figure out what to do with the weeds. God's a good gardener. He'll show you. Let's pray. 
Jesus, we, we, uh, we're, we're mystified. We're mystified at how you can take something that's such a powerful reality and just hand it over to us. How you can put your very presence within us even though we, we are easily distracted, uh, sometimes we get pulled away by the cares of this world, sometimes just broken circumstances cause us to lose heart or to feel frustrated or disappointed. And yet you still are resolute in keeping your kingdom within us, in keeping your presence in us. Because you will never give up on us. You have set your seal in our hearts, your very spirit. So Spirit of God, I pray that you would challenge us and invite us deeper into the presence of Christ. That we would find that space to be able to stand in your presence completely unashamed by all the things that we wish were different about our lives. You see them anyway. It almost feels like in this moment, God, you're just inviting us to be encouraged by the fact that you're not nervous. That you are not disappointed by those things in our lives that are still not where they should be. You know that there's weeds in our garden. You just invite us to trust in you and in your work. So we do that. We invite you, God, just to transform our lives in any way that you see fit. We just want to cooperate with the things you want to do. So if there's anything you want to do in our lives, we just give you an open door, free permission to put it on our hearts this morning, in the coming days, whatever area of our life that you want to work on, we just want to cooperate. And if there's anything else that we're concerned about that you're not leading us to, to deal with, we just give ourselves permission to put it on the shelf so that we can do what you want us to do. Thank you, Lord, that you do not give up on us. Thank you that you've promised to be with us to the very end of our days and to the very end of this age. We hold on to that promise this morning. And we ask you to do something deeper in our hearts today. In your name, Jesus, and for your glory, we pray.